Hello and welcome to Walking Through the Word. I am so glad that you are here. We are walking through the book of James and let me tell you, it's been a a challenging walk. We're definitely climbing uphill as God is stripping off parts of ourselves that we didn't even know were there. As we're dealing with selfishness, as we're dealing with pride, as we're dealing with true, true faith and the response of faith, because faith perseveres, faith loves, faith acts. We're learning about all of these things and we're looking at them through the lens of scripture. We're looking at these things through the word, which means we're having to identify how much worldliness we've allowed to creep into our lives. So welcome, welcome, welcome. The foundation text is 2 Timothy 2.15. If you're just joining us, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be, to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. And I just want to tell you, take a deep breath in, let it out. Because before we even start our walk today, James 2 20 through 24 is one of the most difficult passages about salvation in all of the New Testament. Yes, that is the truth. It's one of the most difficult passages about salvation in the entire New Testament. And the difficulty becomes evident when we put two passages of scripture side by side. When we look at James 2, 24, and we look at Romans 3, 28, James 2, 24, and this is the ESV. It says, you see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. Okay. You see that a person is justified by works, not by faith alone. And then we look at Romans 3, 28 ESV. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Okay. I'm coming right out of the gate. With these two scriptures next to themselves, because we have to deal with it. In James 2, 24, we read that a person is justified by what he does, not by faith alone. Then in Romans 3, 28, we read that a man is justified by faith apart from his works. So immediately we ask, which one is it? And so I'm going to take my time today because we have to keep the whole context of the word, the whole context of scripture in, in mind as we're reading this. We need to look at the entire context of James 2, 14 through 24 as it relates to the entire word and to the entire Bible. So we need to keep James 2, 14 through 24 in mind, even though we're only looking at 20 through 24. Remember, if you take a text out of context, it becomes a con when you're trying to prove a point. It becomes a con when you're trying to prove a point. So back to James here. In a sense, James 2.24 summarizes the whole book of James. Kind of like how Romans 3.28 summarizes the whole book of Romans. So the question becomes, what in the heck are we supposed to do? How are we to understand this? And I'm so glad you asked because that is why we're here today. We first need to know that James and Paul are not contradicting themselves. The Bible is not contradicting themselves. Each of them are are writing about the exact same gospel, yet they're writing from different vantage points and they're addressing different problems in the churches to whom they're writing. Think for a minute about the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They share lots of the same accounts of things that have happened, but each author presented it from a different view. You know, think about us for a moment. We can all see the same incident or the same movie and certain things stand out to me. The things that are important to me will be different for you. And I'm going to remember and write about what stands out for me. You know, one morning, Eric and I started talking about our Bible reading for that day. Now, be mindful that we are reading from the, we got the same book, the same Bible, same devotions. We're reading it every single day. And we both read the same thing. And when we sat down to discuss it, I didn't even know what he said was in there. He didn't even catch what I read. Neither of us remember the other person's point of view. I had to go back and read it again to see what Eric saw. He had to go back and read it again to see what I saw. And so I want you to take that into mind as we're reading this. But back to James and Paul. You know, imagine them standing back to back. They're not at each other disagreeing and, you know, contradicting one another. I want you to imagine James and Paul standing back to back with each other fighting two different enemies 
while defending a unified understanding of the gospel. They are back to back in this. You know, Paul is fighting against the false idea that we can earn our salvation with our works. And James, on the other hand, is fighting against a belief that reduced salvation to totally intellectual belief. And think about it. Which battles are we fighting today? The answer is both. Most followers of Christ, whether they admit it or not, think they can work their way to God. If I just pray more, if I read more, if I do more, if I do more, I'm going to please God. I haven't done this, so God is mad at me. That's still relevant today. Others believe that since we're saved by grace through faith, it means works don't matter to God and being obedient is irrelevant. I can live any old kind of way because I got grace and God loves me and he knows my heart. Both of those, we fight both of these today. And the reality is with James and Paul, it's not an either or, it's an and. And I want to make this live for you guys so that we're not walking out of this text confused. Let me help you. Let me make it live. I, I feel like I got to lay this foundation before we start breaking these verses apart and exegeting this text. You know, my family is a sports family. My husband and son both play, played what we call in America, they call it football. Two teams, a brown ball, lots of running, throwing, kicking, all of that. But when I went to Kenya and I said football, their mind goes to two teams, a round ball, lots of running and kicking, but no throwing. See, we say football, they say soccer. Two different images come up. If I show up in Kenya and want to play football, but I bring my American football mindset to it, I'm not going to go well because I'm going to pick up the ball and throw it. It's a similar situation we have in James 2 and Romans 3. So understanding what James is saying and what Paul is saying is contingent on understanding how we grasp their words, how they use certain words, what they are saying, what the meaning was in the original text, because it could not mean something then and mean something different now. So we got to go back to word origin. We got to go back to what they were saying, who they were talking to, why they were saying what they were saying. We need to peek into their mindsets. Because you can have the same word with two different meanings. Football here, football there, different. This is true of our lives and it's true in the Bible as well. And so in order for this, there to be effective communication, we need to understand what someone is saying when they're using a certain word. So as we walk through James 2, we're going to take a break on our walk and we're going to stop at some key words along the way in order to think about how these words are used in the Bible, often in different ways, what their meaning is. So in this process, I want us to see that while the words James and Paul are using may seem contradictory, in the end, both of these men are clearly and boldly preaching the same gospel. They're on the same page. They're singing from the same sheet of music. They are on one accord. So before we take off, I want to point out that James uses Abraham as an example in what he's saying in chapter 2, 21 through 23. Guess what? Paul uses the example of Abraham in Romans 4 as well. Verses 1 through 3. We studied this a few months ago. So I want you to know as we go into this text that Abraham is the model of faith for both of these biblical authors. And in Abraham's life, we're going to see the truth of what James teaches and what Paul teaches. We're going to see it in action. Remember last week we said faith acts. So yes, just a quick recap if you're joining us. If you haven't heard these other lessons, I encourage you to go to my YouTube station and listen to them. Go to my social media pages and listen to them because every one of these lessons is building upon the lesson before it. You know, in week one, we talked about faith perseveres. In week two, we talked about faith obeys. Week three, we talked about faith love. Week four, we talked about faith acts. And this week, week five, we're talking about faith sacrifices. Faith sacrifices. That's a lot of background information. But I believe it's necessary as we begin to talk to these verses. If you don't know this info, this info coming to this text, I think we will miss the meat of it and the heart of it. So week five, faith sacrifices. The main idea in the text is this. The faith that saves always produces good works and is based on God's saving work in Jesus Christ. The faith that saves always produces good works. And it's based on God's saving work 
in Jesus Christ. Let's get started with our reading. Take another deep breath in. This is going to be a good one. Let it out. This is a Bible seminary course today. So I pray you have your Bible, something to take some notes with, and something to write on. Because you just walked into seminary class. Okay, verse 20. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? Verse 22. You see that faith was active long, along with his works and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. Verse 24. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. A person is justified by works and not faith alone. Ooh, I want you to look at verse 20. The first thing that we read is that faith without works is useless. This is the same point that James made in chapters 2, 14 through 19. We talked about that last week. And it's extremely important for us to remember this when we get to verse 24. I need you to remember that in this passage, James is not contrasting mature faith with immature faith. He's not looking at lukewarm faith compared to dynamic faith. No, James is contrasting genuine faith with a professed faith that does not exist. A genuine professed faith against one that doesn't exist. That's what he's talking about. So he is saying that some people are claiming to have faith, but for example, they don't care for the poor. They don't control their tongue. Thus their so-called faith consists of nothing more than what demons have. That was all of last week's lesson. So James is saying that this is not really faith. If you're not willing to help people, you're not willing to shut your mouth. You're not willing to do what the word says do. Your faith is dead. It is nothing. So in a very few, blah, 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 in a very few short verses today, we're going to find several pictures. And let me tell you, this is a lot of theology, a lot of application. So I'm going to do everything in my power to stick strictly with my notes today because we don't even have time or space to get off. So let's look. At these pictures let's start walking through the pictures that we see today and we're going to see two pictures of faith found in james 2 20. two pictures of faith the first picture we see is dead faith and this dead faith does not save you know as we've already said we've already seen in james a person's faith that claims to believe in jesus for our salvation yet ignores the poor at his doorsteps doesn't do what God says do, doesn't meet the needs, is not merciful, is not forgiving, is not lovable. That's not faith at all. That's chapter 2, 14 through 17. So James calls him a foolish man in verse 20. Take a look at it. A foolish man. The Greek word here means empty, which means James is saying that a person claiming to have faith without deeds has nothing. He's got nothing. So he definitely doesn't have faith. And so the second picture we see here of faith is of a living faith. And this living faith does save. In every mention of faith in this epistle outside of this passage, James is talking about living faith. We mentioned that last week. Faith in our glorious Jesus Christ. We see that chapter 2 and 1. A faith that perseveres through trials. Chapter 1, verse 3 and 6. A faith that avoids favoritism. We talked about in this, that in verse 5. Yet in 2, chapter 2, 14 through 24, James introduces an imaginary person who claims to have faith without deeds. And James says over and over again that such people, they really don't have faith at all. So both James and Paul say dead faith does not save. Say that to yourself. Say it out loud. Put it in the chat. Dead faith does not save. So I need you to take a minute, take a seat. For a minute on this imaginary bench and i want you to pull out your mirror and i want you to look at yourself look at yourself in the mirror imagine me holding the mirror here is your faith dead or living is your faith only about intellectual assent what you what you know about god or is it about belief in god or christ is your faith alive is it penetrating is it transforming every part of who you are because true faith literally runs all over you this is an eternally important question because is your faith dead or is your faith alive has everything to do with where you spend eternity. After 
seeing these two different pictures of faith, dead and living, we get to verse 21. This is important. We get to two pictures of righteousness. And I want you to know the word righteousness is used in a variety of ways throughout scripture. But two ways in particular are very relevant to this passage. And I want you to know this. We see these same points in the righteousness teaching of Paul as well. So picture number one is positional righteousness. Positional righteousness. We talked about that when we were studying Romans. Positional righteousness. You know, how we stand before God. What is your position before the Father? This happens at the initial point of salvation. When you trust in Christ for salvation by God's grace, you're made right before God. Christ imputes, he grants, and he clothes you in his righteousness at the moment of your salvation. That's 2 Corinthians 5.21. When you're saved, you are made right before God. You, me, a sinner. We now have peace with God because of the righteousness of Christ Jesus. That happens at salvation. But then scripture also gives us picture number two, which is practical righteousness. What is that? Is how we live before God. Yes, positional is where I stand with God, but practical is how I live before God. And my life before God should demonstrate me growing a life of changing. I should be growing in righteousness in the way that I live. When I first get saved, I don't know the word of God. You know, the things that I used to do and those habits, I, I, didn't, I didn't even know that they were opposing God, which is why my mind has to be renewed to the things of God, to the word of God, to the truth of God, to what God expects of me now that I'm a child. Because before I was a creation of God, but when I got in a relationship and I got saved, I became a child. So you're born a creation, but you become a child when you get adopted into the family of God. So you get that positional righteousness, but now I have a responsibility to grow in my practical righteousness, how I live before God. So as my mind is being renewed to truth, as I understand what he expects of me, when I begin to understand more and more what he sacrificed for me, then my life should reflect that. So those who are counted as righteous in Christ, we must practically manifest righteousness in our lives as we grow in the likeness of Christ. I have a responsibility to be an imitator of Christ, which means I have to be focused on becoming more like him in every every day of my life, in every way of my life, in every area. So at times in scripture, we have righteousness referring to how we stand before God. And other times we have righteousness that refers to how we live before God. Think about that. One is how I stand before God and one is how I live before God. So what James is talking about here when he's talking about righteousness becomes even clearer as we walk into this passage. So, so far we've looked at two pictures of faith. We've now looked at two pictures of righteousness. Now we need to consider two pictures of works. Look at James 20, James 2, 2, blah, blah, James 2, 22. It says, you see that faith was active along with his works and faith was completed by his works. When you look up the word work here, it's sometimes translated actions. Other times it's translated deeds. So when you see works or actions or deeds in the New Testament, you'll notice that scripture sometimes refers to works in a positive way. And other times it refers to work in a negative way. I need y'all to get this because you can't assume it's the same way every time you read the word. So let's start with the negative. Sometimes scripture speaks of works fueled by the flesh. Those works fueled by the flesh do not honor God. This is the way Paul often talks about works. He talks about works of the law done in order to earn favor before God. That goes back to Romans 3.28. Throughout Romans and Galatians, Paul talks against people attempting to earn salvation by their works. They were being circumcised. They were obtaining from certain foods. They were obeying various laws, laws, all being done in an attempt to make themselves righteous for, before God. But Paul says, your works done to earn favor before God do not honor God and they cannot save you. They can't save you because you cannot earn your way to God. Salvation is a gift freely given. So you can't earn your way to it. And so this is the danger of legalism, a danger all of us must be on guard against. We all must be on guard against and we got to be aware it can creep up into your life. 
Because legalism is believing that being right before God is the result of doing enough to earn his favor. Let me help you with something. There's not enough doing you can do to make yourself right with God. You can't do enough to have your sins forgiven. You can't do enough to, to be rescued. You can't, there's not enough you can do. And so this is what Paul is teaching against over and over again. Works fueled by the flesh that do not honor God. We talked about that as we walked through Romans. So this is where I need for you to pull close. Legalism is not what James is talking about when he talks about works. Paul is talking about something different. James is talking about something different. See, James refers to the works and deeds and actions 15 times. And every reference James uses is positive. Why? Because every time James talks about works, he's talking about works that are the fruit of faith, which glorifies God. There's different There's works that are the fruit of your flesh, negative, doesn't honor God. And there are works that are fruit of faith, which glorifies God. So when James is talking about works, he's talking about God glorifying obedience. As you've seen for the last three or four weeks, love for the needy, mercy for the poor, caring for people in need. These works are the fruit of faith in God. This is the evidence. This is the evidence. Paul also spoke about works in this way. He spoke of the obedience of faith. He talked about the work of faith. I want you to think back to Galatians 5 and 6 when he said, what matters is faith working through love. Paul also said the same thing James said. Paul and James are unified on this point. I need you to see that because people argue and they say this is contradictory. It is not. They are in agreement on these same points. See, James is not advocating works in the flesh done to earn favor before God. Paul is teaching about works produced by faith that bring glory to God. They both teach the same thing. They both teach the same thing. Both James and Paul see faith and works working together, which is exactly what James is talking about in chapter 2, verses 20 through 24. They work together. And here's what's beautiful. Abraham is our example of this. So I got to ask a very important question. How does all of this work? How did this work? How does this work according to what James says? How does this work according to what Paul says? It works because faith creates works. Faith creates works. James says in verses 22 through 23, look at him. You see that faith was active along with his works and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness and he was called a friend of God. You see this? This is a lot of text, but I need for you to grab it. James quotes here. I want you to see this. He's going back to Genesis 15. He's going back to the story of Abraham. Abraham, excuse me. There's a progression in Abraham's life that both James and Paul refer to. And we got to talk about this so that you could understand what he's teaching. You know, God enters into covenant with Abraham, and here's how it happens. Turn with, turn with me to Genesis 15, 1 through 6. God's covenant with Abraham. Verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to to Abram in in a vision. Fear not, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless. And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars. If you're able to number them, then he said to them, So so shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord and he counted it to him as righteousness. I want you to see this because God gave Abraham his promise and Abraham believed God. Abraham received a promise. He believed God. Abraham's faith in God was credited to him in righteousness. It was like put into his faith account. But then I want us to turn to Genesis 22, where God has given Abraham a son. He's given him Isaac. Isaac. 
So in verses 1 and 2, God tells Abraham to offer his son as a burnt offering. So then Abraham goes to the mountain with Isaac. He raises his knife to sacrifice his only son, the one we just read about that was promised to him. And then we read the following. Look at Genesis 22. I want us to look at verse 11 and 12. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on your boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. Okay. I encourage you to go back and read these chapters when you get some time. We don't have time to unpack them all today, but you do need to read this. You need to be familiar with this because the question becomes, when did Abraham first believe God? Was it in Genesis 22? When all this happened, was it Genesis 15? When was it? When was it? You know, Abraham believed God a long time before 22. You know, scholars say that between Genesis 15 and Genesis 22, they're like 30 years. 30 years of waiting in between chapter 15 and chapter 22. But what we see here is that Abraham's faith resulted in works of obedience when God called him to sacrifice his son. And so James is saying in chapter two that his willingness to sacrifice his only son, the promise that he believed, the promise that he waited for, and the promise that he finally got is the fruit of faith. Just like when you take an apple seed and plant it in the ground, you're one day going to see an apple tree. May not, it's not going to be tomorrow. It's not going to be the next day. It may be years. But in the same way, when faith is born in a person's heart, it will bear fruit. When faith is born in a person's heart, it's going to bear, by, Lumba, it's going to bear fruit. I'm getting excited, y'all, because this is, this is so much. And I've been studying this, so I'm kind of navigating through this book, and I want to tell you too much, and I can't, so I got to slow down. Faith born in a person's heart bears fruit. So by its very nature, faith creates works. Write that down. Faith is born in a person's heart. It bears fruit, which leads faith to create works. And once faith creates these works, then these works complete faith. This is a beautiful cycle. It's beautiful. James says in verse 22, by works, faith was perfected. He's talking about Abraham here. It was completed. It was complete. This is, it, it was perfect. Before you ask, what the heck does perfected mean? What does complete faith mean? It means bring it to maturity. Completes it and perfects it means brings it to a place of maturity. Abraham's work matured his faith. Brought his faith to its finished goal. James is saying that when we obey God, when we do the work, our faith grows up. It matures and it's brought to completion. We're able to mature in the things of God. We are responsible for our own spiritual formation. We're responsible for our own spiritual maturity. You don't get to get saved and be done. Getting saved is the start of the spiritual formation process. It's the beginning of spiritual maturity. You know, and when you understand this, you might, um, you get that we obey God. We obey him. We respond to his word. We do what he says. And the more we do that, our faith grows. You know, everyone's been given the measure of faith, but it's kind of like a muscle. We all have it. But if you don't work your muscle, if you're not stretching, if you're not using it, if you're not developing it, it's not being strengthened. We have to grow our faith. We have to strengthen our faith. And as we do this, faith leads us to be obedient and obedience matures us in our faith. This is, this is beautiful and I pray you're letting this seek in because works are good when they are the fruit of our faith. Works are good when they're the fruit of our faith. They don't need to be the fruit of our flesh. And you can, I can hear somebody saying right now, this is so deep. It's, we're so, all this theology, all this old covenant, new covenant faith and righteousness talk. Let me explain what this looks like in today's language. You know, works are good when they're fruit of the faith. You know, this can be lived out in some of our basic Christian actions, like number one, coming to corporate worship. 
I know this one hits home for a lot of us, but take a seat. Let's talk. If you go to a worship gathering fueled by the flesh in order to put on a face before man, if you're going to impress your pastor or you're going to earn favor before God, then this work of worship does not bring honor to God. But if you're coming is the fruit of faith. If you believe and love God and if you trust that he knows what he's saying when he tells us not to forsake gathering together, Hebrews 10, 25, your actions honor God. What's the heart motive behind the work? You know, when your faith drives you to corporate worship with God's people, leading you to sing spiritual songs, listening to the word of God, fellowshipping with other believers, then this is part of bringing your faith to maturity. This is you maybe sacrificing some time and getting uncomfortable and coming to a place to be obedient. I'm honoring God because he says I need to come together with people who believe like I believe. And we need to be built up and we need to be encouraged and we need to grow out so we can live this life. I tell our team here at um, Awaken that we gather on Sunday to scatter on Monday. So we come here. So I come into the to the huddle. If you are a sports person, you go into the dugout or you go into the locker room to get yourself together, to get the instruction, to get what you need. But then you go back on the field and play. That's how it's supposed to be with the church. We come together. We get built up. We pray for one another. We serve one another. We help those that are in need. We celebrate those that need to be celebrated. We walk with those who are in difficult seasons. And then we go back to the field on Monday and we do the work. We get back on the battlefield for our Lord. We're doing this not because I want somebody to see me, but because I've seen the goodness of Jesus. I've seen how he has saved and rescued my life. I've seen what he's done for me when I didn't deserve it. And because I've seen him, I'm going to see about being about his business. I want to be about my father's business. The next thing is, you know, spending concentrated time in prayer and in Bible study. If you're doing these things in the flesh because it's become a religious routine or you're doing them in order to earn favor with God, then your doing is not good. But if you believe your delight is found in God and you want to know him, you want to hear from him, you want to share your heart with him, then your quiet time is a really good work because it's a time of intimacy. It's a time of fellowship. It's a time of you growing up and becoming more like him. What's your motive? Caring for the poor. If you help people in the flesh because you feel like you have to, to earn favor with God and you're doing this because you want people to see what you're doing, then caring for the poor will not honor God. But if you believe God when he says this is important to him and to his people that you spend yourself on helping the poor, not only your money, but your time on helping the poor. Though when you're radically caring for people that are hurting, that are dealing with poverty, that are lonely and needy, then your faith will be made complete in what you do. Faith is living, it's active, it's productive. And when you are in relationship with God and you have the faith of God flowing through you, it is impossible to not do good work. The faith in you is always looking for a people to pour into. Let me say that again. The faith in you is always looking for a people to pour into. We're supposed to be living a life poured out. And yes, let me share something. At Ripple Effects, We share pictures of the work that we do, and I promise you, it is not to promote Ripple Effects Group. It's not to promote Awaken Church. We're not trying to promote Bethel Church. We're not trying to promote Ripple Effects Kenya. No, what we're doing is showing the people who partner with us where their resources are going. And we're giving other people an opportunity to see the work that we're doing, to become a part of it. It is not to toot our own horns. It's not to make us great. It's not to do any of that. It is so people can see. Not everyone gets to see the work that's being done in the office here in America or being done in Kenya. Everybody doesn't get to see it because they don't necessarily have their hands because some get to go, but some get to sow. So we show that and share that. So those who sow into this work get to see their fruit. They get to see it. The faith in you is always looking for people to pour into. It's always looking for a place to pour into. It's always looking for someone to partner with to do the work of the kingdom. Bless the Lord. This is good. But we got to move on to verse 24. (laughs) The most controversial verse in this passage. Verse 24. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. So what in the world does James mean that we're not justified by faith alone? 
I need you to remember that throughout this entire passage, James is talking about, he's been talking with these imaginary people who claim to have faith, but don't really have it. He's talking to people that have dead faith, the kind that's not really faith at all. So when we get to verse 24, James is communicating the same thing to them. He is saying again that this kind of faith does not justify. This kind of faith does not save. Why? Because this so-called faith is not really faith at all. Now, all James is saying is that we are not justified by a faith that claims to believe in Jesus, but does nothing. Let me say that again. We are not justified by faith that claims to believe in Jesus, but does nothing. This type of faith is no different than the demon's belief. And it's dead. When James refers to faith alone in verse 24, look at it, underline it, circle it. He's not talking about the same kind of faith Paul talks about or even the same kind of faith he himself talks about in the rest of the book of James. He's not talking about living faith. That's not what he's saying. When James says faith alone in verse 24, he's referring to dead, demonic, intellectual faith that he is countering throughout the entire passage. When we read verse 24, it has to be read and understood through the lens of the verses before it. You cannot pull it out and separate it. No, James and Paul are not contradicting each other. They both agree that living faith produces works. Living faith produces works. So with that being said, there's even another big idea at the beginning of verse 24 that needs to be walked through. James says a man is justified by works. In other words, works in some sense play into our justification. You got to look at this in context. This, this leads us to the last word we need to walk through. Justification. Justification. A simple def definition of justification is to be declared right. I need you to pull close for this. Sit down. Let's talk. As we think about salvation, the picture is that we are declared right before God. When you look at salvation, we're declared right before God. So the question becomes how we declare right before God. Is it by faith or by works? The answer to this question is big. And the whole gospel hinges on your understanding it for you. The gospel hinges on this. This is where Paul and James both use Abraham to talk about justification, but they use different points about Abraham's life to do it. Paul's main point in the book of Romans is that Abraham was justified by faith before he did anything, before he was circumcised, before he had Isaac, before he was willing to sacrifice Isaac, before all of this, he was justified. Abraham had faith and his faith was credited to him as righteousness. That's Romans 4, 3. James is emphasizing something altogether different. He's talking about Abraham was willing to sacrifice Isaac in obedience to God. And James says that Abraham was considered righteous when he did that. Okay. These are two different perspectives on Abraham's life. One from the standpoint of his initial faith that happened in, I believe, Genesis 15. And the other looking back on his life of obedience, Genesis 22, separated by 30 plus years. So what we're looking through both of their views, we get a different picture. We get two pictures of justification in verse 24. First, this is a good place to take some notes if you're not taking notes. When Paul talks about justification, he's most often talking about initial justification, which is the inception of the Christian life. Initial justification is when you turn from yourself and trust in Jesus as the only one who can save you. God clothes you with his righteousness of Christ and by his grace declares you right before him. That's Romans 4, 3 through 5. That's Galatians 2, 16. In Ephesians 2 and 8, Paul says, For you are saved by grace through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God. Paul wants us to avoid thinking that works are a necessary basis 
for our means of salvation. He's like, no, they don't go together. So Paul is calling us to believe in a God, not in the sense that demons believe. He's calling us to believe in God, to believe in Jesus as the sovereign Lord and King who alone has paid the price for our sins on the cross, who's finished the work of salvation for for us so that nothing more can be added to that work. When Jesus said it's finished on the cross, he meant it. It is finished. We believe in Jesus and we're saved. This is what Paul means when he talks about justification in Romans 3, 21 through 26. At the moment you trust in Christ, you are justified before God. But that does not mean that James is using the words in the same way. In the Old Testament and in Jesus' teaching, this term justification is oftentimes used in reference not just to the initial point of salvation, but to the final judgment where we stand before God. It's like one is we stand before God and we get saved. And then the other is we stand before God and we're getting judged. This is why it's so important to have a Bible teacher helping you decipher and discern the text in context with what is being written, to whom it is being written and why it's being written. That's why we need teachers. Thank God for good Bible teachers. It's not enough to read the word. We got to study it. Which is why we meet here every week to walk through it together. We got to be taught these things. Why is this so important? Because Paul is specifically talking about initial justification. The justification that happens at the point of salvation. When you first believe. When you declare it right before God. James is not talking about initial justification. He is talking about final justification. Final justification refers to what's going to happen on the day of judgment when God declares us right in his sight. Okay, let me explain. As opposed to talking about the inception, that initial justification of the Christian's life, James is talking about the confirmation. Paul is talking about the inception and James is talking about the confirmation. This is what happens on the final day when we who are declared righteous initially will be declared righteous openly. Chew on that for a minute. What James is confronting in this letter is different than what Paul was confronting in his letter. Paul wants us to avoid thinking we need to work in order to earn salvation. James wants us to avoid thinking that works are not necessary as evidence of our salvation. Let me repeat that. Paul wants us to avoid thinking we need to work in order to earn salvation. James wants us to avoid thinking that works are not necessary as evidence of our salvation. Final justification is not based on works, but James wants us to see that when we stand before God on the day of judgment, it will be clear whether or not we had real, true, and authentic faith or deed, whether or not we had demonic faith. Our works are going to be the evidence of really was there an initial justification. I know this is harsh. It's a lot. Go back and listen to this. Get the notes. Study this. Final justification is not based on your works. But what happens, your works are revealed. It'll reveal whether or not you had real, true, authentic faith. Or if you had demonic faith. Your works are the evidence that there was really an initial justification. Your works are evidence that you are in Christ. Your works are the evidence of what you believe. Do you believe God in your head, but you never made him Lord of your life? You never obeyed him? Because if you believed him, if you received him, if you accepted him, if you embraced him, if you are a true Christ follower, there will be evidence. If you are a true Christ follower, your life will have evidence. You may ask the question, how will I know if my faith is or was real? The the, the answer is simple. Is there fruit? Is there evidence? Because if there was faith, there will be fruit. If there is faith, there will be fruit. If there is no faith, there is no fruit. You know, Paul says Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness at the moment he believed. So that leads us to another question of how do we know Abraham's faith was real? How do we know it was real? 
James tells us Abraham's faith was so real that he was willing to sacrifice his only son in obedience to God. His willingness to sacrifice was the evidence that was the fruit of the faith that he received when it was credited to him as righteousness. It's just making sense. When Paul says in Romans 3.28, for we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. He is saying a man is justified by wholehearted trust in the grace of Christ. Not from any work he can do to earn his way to God. James is in the background saying, amen, Paul. When James says in chapter 2, verse 24, you see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. He is saying a man is not justified by a cold intellectual belief in Jesus that even the demons believe. He's saying a man is justified by faith that produces radical obedience and sacrifice. I can hear Paul in the background saying, amen, brother. I know all of this sounds confusing, but it is not. Paul is preaching. James is preaching. And they're both using Abraham in their illustrated sermon. So we can see both sides of the coin. That it does take faith. And the evidence of that faith is works. If you have faith, there will be fruit. I want to summarize everything that we're talking about today. With just two truths to remember and we're done. Number one, write this down. Salvation is through faith. Faith alone and Christ alone. We are not saved through works. We're saved through faith. Through initial faith in Christ, we're made right before God the Father. Through initial faith in Christ, we're made right before God the Father. So if you were to ask Paul and James, how can I be saved? They would both answer the same way. Christ is the basis for your salvation. You know, James speaks of having faith in Jesus, chapter 2, verse 1. It all comes back to Jesus. Jesus has done the work. He's conquered sin and he's purchased righteousness for us. So there is no work for us to do to be saved. His work on the cross and in the resurrection is the basis of our salvation. Faith is the means of our salvation. So what we need to do is trust in the person and the work of Christ. This is how we can be saved. Acts 16, 31. We need to turn from ourselves and trust in Christ to save us from our sins and to be Lord of our life. That's how we're made right with God the Father. And when we receive that, this should give us a radical confidence. Because we don't have to fear anything in this life. We don't have to fear de death because we're right before God, the father of all eternity. We don't have to fear man. Why? Because we're right with Christ. There's nothing that can come against us that, that Christ doesn't have a plan for. Greater is he that's in us than he that's in this world. We, can, we don't have to fear. We don't have to be anxious. We don't have to worry because we know that Christ is in us and we're in him. Salvation comes through faith alone, in Christ alone, by grace alone. We drill that week after week as we study Romans. The second truth to summarize this passage is that faith works. Faith works. When Christ gives you spiritual birth, he gives you spiritual life. A life that is radically different and a life that bears great fruit. Look at Abraham. Through his initial trust in God, he was made right before God the Father. But through continual faith in Christ, we walk with God as a friend. Think about that. Abraham trusted in God and he was made right before God. But as he walked with God, as he continued his faith, there was evidence. We've got Jesus. Through continual faith in Christ, we walk with God as a friend. We walk with God as a friend. We can't be right with God and have no interest in walking with him. How are you right with God and don't care about him? How can you be right with God and have no desire to get to know him, his ways and his word? How can you be right with God and don't care how you live? You know, James says people who claim to be right with God but are not walking with God don't have faith. Their faith is dead. The picture of Abraham being called God's friend in James 2.23 is not an exact quote from the Old Testament, but is similar to the description given to Abraham in 2 Chronicles 20 and 7 and Isaiah 41 and 8. He was a friend of God. This is the same picture we hear 
from the mouth of Jesus, the words that we hear from the mouth of Jesus when he says to his disciples in John 15, 14, you are my friends if you do what I command you. You are my friends if you do what I command you. It's the natural overflow of knowing God as father to enjoy him as friend. This type of faith results in radical obedience. When your faith is in God as father and as a friend, then you don't need to be afraid to obey him. You don't need to to fear his commands. Even when he says to do things that makes no sense to us or to the world around us, when he calls us to take steps that risk everything, we can obey. I remember when when God began to speak to me and Eric about me leaving my full-time job with two kids in college. We were already struggling financially. And God says, give up half of your income. Because I want you to go begin ripple effects. I want you to pour what you have into ripple effects. It made no sense. I had friends tell me I was crazy. We had people say that we weren't being wise. We weren't being good stewards. We had so much criticism. We had people tell us that it would never work. But we knew deep in our hearts, Eric and I knew that this was God. We knew that it was the timing. Was it easy? No. Did we struggle? Yes. Did I have questions? Yes. Did my husband have questions? Yes. Did our kids think we were crazy? Yes. But we were trusting in God. We didn't know what tomorrow was going to hold. We didn't know what was going to happen. But we know God wouldn't tell us to step out into the deep and not let us walk. We knew he was calling us to be water walkers and he wasn't going to let us sink. So as long as we were like Peter and kept our eyes on him, we could walk. It didn't make sense. But God, God's going to ask you to do things that don't make sense. He's going to ask you to sacrifice sometimes and you don't understand. He's going to ask you to sow. He's going to ask you to go. And it doesn't make sense. Kind of like Abraham. He asked him to sacrifice his son. But he trusted God wholeheartedly and God had a plan. And just like he had a plan for Abraham, he had a plan for me. He's got a plan for you. And when we trust God, we will follow him sacrificially because faith sacrifices. We will sacrifice in obedience to God's command. We sacrifice. It's a price tag that comes along with obedience. The price tag is not going to scare us off because we know Faith works. We know God's word is true. We know that it cannot lie. We know that every promise God has made us is yes and amen in Christ Jesus. And when it gets scary and it gets difficult and I can't understand, I remind him of his promises. I remind him of his word. That's why it's so important for us to study the word. That's why we have to walk through the word. That's why we have to memorize the word. So when your feet get unsteady and the winds of life start blowing and you can realize and you come to the realization, I don't know what to do. It may not be that you need to know what to do, but you need to know who to call. And we need a faith that we understand has to sacrifice. Faith sacrifices. Real faith is uncomfortable. Real faith is inconvenient. But I can tell you the truth. Eric and I have been called out on some things. We've stepped out on some things. And God has always seen this through. Maybe not as quick as we want it to. Maybe not in the manner that we want it to. But he's been faithful. And he has had a way of making every sacrifice end up being a blessing. And we've realized that even when we do sacrifice, that seeds leave our hand. But they never leave our life. We can sow one place or sacrifice one place. And a harvest will come up someplace else. That's God. We don't need to keep score. We don't need to keep record because he's just and he's faithful. He's loving and he's merciful. And he always keeps his word. You know, our theme for today's lesson is the faith that saves always produces good works and is based on God's saving work in Jesus Christ. Our memory verse this week is so fitting. It's John 15, 14. You are my friends. If you do what I command you, are you living as a friend or an enemy of God? Now, I want us to memorize this verse. So when we are caught up in tough situations and we are needing to make decisions and we're needing to do things, we got to ask ourselves, am I being a friend of God? Am I doing what he commands? Am I being a friend of God in this? Am I talking like a friend of God? Am I walking like a friend of God? Am I acting, behaving, thinking 
Am I representing myself as a friend of God? I think that's going to begin to shape how we interact with one another. Our up close and personal questions this week. What works or spiritual disciplines are you tempted to rely on for your right standing with God? Where are you tempted to slip into the ditch of legalism? Where is it that you make those disciplines about you? And then I want you to really get still and ask yourself, what is the basis of your salvation? And why is it so crucial for you to know this truth? We can't share it with others if we ourselves don't know it, if we don't know it. I want to invite you to partner with us here at Ripple Effects Group. Um, we are committed to feed people spiritually and physically, emotionally and mentally. We want to meet people right where they are. So if it's in your heart to partner with us, ways to partner with our organization and the work that we're doing that's on the screen, let's do this together. Let's go, let's sow, let's be the hands and feet of Jesus together. Next week, we're going to talk about faith risk. Ooh, and look at it. We're only talking about James 2, 25 and 26. Faith risk. This is going to be a big one. Read it, meditate, marinate. Because God is doing a work on the inside of us. And I believe we are changing. We are growing. Things are falling off of us. And faith is being built up on the inside of us. So next week, same place, same time. Until then, do you on mass in Jesus. God bless you.